Yesterday, a female fan of the show sent me a message over Instagram that stopped me cold in my tracks. She complained that I complained too much about black culture without offering any solutions. I felt the sincerity of her comments and felt like she's a sincere fan of this show. I felt like I owed her a deeper explanation about what Fearless is about and what I'm about, and most of all, what happened to black culture. I contend the Alphabet Mafia made us hostile to truth, embrace idolatry, and celebrate the matriarchy, and that is destroying America. Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, happy Wednesday, happy hump day, happy uh, Tennessee Harmony Day to you and yours. Uh, we have a fantastic show uh, planned for you today. Uh, I do know for a fact, Pastor Anthony will be here today to help me at some point unpack this conversation that I wanna lead today. Uh, Dave Shannon and Shamika Michelle are on standby. They may be joining me today if I'm not too long-winded, but this could go on uh, for quite some time today. And if I don't get to Dave and Shamika today, I'm gonna bring them into this conversation uh, tomorrow. Uh, I've got a fire starter uh, that I'm gonna unpack here. It's unscripted, uh, but I, I, I just, I want to address what we're doing with this show. As I said in the cold open, I got a letter or an email, a direct message that stopped me in my tracks and, and made me go, well, hold on. I offer no solutions and I hear this, she's not the first person to make this allegation that I talk about problems without offering a solution. And, and this stops me in my track because I'm like, do these guys even understand the point of this show? Is the actual message of the show going over people's head? And so I'm gonna to take today, and if necessary tomorrow, and if necessary the day after that, to unpack what it is we're doing here at Fearless and the solution that we're offering. But I wanna start by reading the letter uh, that the young woman, uh, sent me over Instagram. I believe her name is Loretta. I, I thought about inviting her on the show and I hope Loretta's watching because maybe we do need to have Loretta on the show because based off this letter, she is a longtime follower of my work. But uh, without further ado, let me share what she wrote to me. Uh, let me say this again, and this is on, a, I posted something on Instagram, a picture, and a graphic with a quote from, from about, you know, what's going on with African-Americans and black culture. And this was her response. Let me say this again about the fact you enjoy discussing problems in the African-American community, but never offer any solutions. We can go to the internet or YouTube to find all the speeches possible. Black Lives Matter was started in 2014. Many African-Americans don't support BLM. Their behavior is their responsibility. In New York City, they aren't even active because the mayor doesn't support it. I see you showing videos and pictures. I've never seen you in any of these videos. You have a great concern about fatherless children and crime in American communities. Everyone will read this and all the other posts you put up. It isn't going to solve the problem. How often do you visit these inner city African American communities, communities and offer resources or support? You're an African American male who has achieved. Why don't you give back? You criticize LeBron James, but at least he created a school. I listened to your video about how LeBron James can't say he faces raci racism because he is wealthy. You stated, quote, I can just throw my keys to a Spanish person and have them park my car. Since you spend so much time on the problem, maybe you can spend equal time on the solution. Let us know what you have been doing to help. 
And this, it, this ending part where she talks about you can throw your keys to a Spanish person and have them parked by car, this is the indicator that like, whoa, this person has been following me for a long time. She's talking about something I said on Speak for Yourself years ago, three or four years ago. Uh, she, she, she's not talking about this fearless program. Following my work, my work is obviously having an impact. It obviously frustrates her, the, the focus of my work. There's, let me address a couple other things here in terms of how often do you do visit these inner city, inner city African American communities and offer resources or support. I don't visit these inner city African communities because I live in one. I live in a zip code that, based on my research here in Nashville, is 40% black. Uh, I'm not living off in, and again, I live in, I, I wanna be clear here, live in a very nice place, very nice building. It's a high rent area. But I live in downtown Nashville. Th there are black people everywhere. I, I'm not, I can walk to the hood uh, very easily. The hood can walk to my neighborhood very easily. The problems that are associated with the hood visit my street. I've talked about that. So I don't have to visit anywhere. I live there. That's one. As it relates to, and this always goes, what support and resources have you offered? I don't operate that way in terms of, I'm not Colin Kaepernick, I'm not LeBron James, I'm not trying to build a brand by, hey, I donated this much money to a school, hey, I started a I Know Your Rights camp or whatever. I, I don't do all these public things looking for public affirmation about what it is I do. If you follow this show as closely, or me as closely as you say you do, these questions answer themselves because they come up organically in terms of what I do. And I don't put this information out there as some sort of, hey, look how great of a human being I am. I don't put it out there like that. But if you follow this show and follow the conversation and my work over the course, speak for yourself, go back to ESPN. You wouldn't ask this question about what it is I'm doing. You would have heard it. And I predict you have heard it. I'm going to cite just a couple of examples, not to be defensive, but just to try to explain to people that like this is an unfair accusation and assertion. When, when, when someone has shared with you over the course when I was on Speak for Yourself, it's come up on this show when we've talked about China. Uh, Wendell Brown, black kid from Detroit that played football at Ball State University 20 years after me. This is a kid who got arrested and jailed in China for three years. Not saying this bragging. I'm just, it's come up on this show. It's been written about in media platforms. I paid $40,000 to get the man out of a Chinese prison. This is no secret. The number of kids that I've adopted, helped get through school, transition in life, but I don't have to, I don't do it in that way to be public because I'm not trying to build a brand. The stuff does come up on this show, you follow my work. So I just wanna put that to the side. Uh, so I don't need to visit because I live, and in terms of what I'm doing, resources and support, I'm, I'm gonna give one more example without naming names. Look at the people I give opportunities to. Some of them have virtually no qualifications for the opportunities that I granted them. 
I'm not going to put any names to it. But again, if you're following the show, following me, some of this stuff is just obvious and staring you in the face. I break my back giving people opportunities who don't meet traditional qualification standards. I put, I back up the beliefs that I espouse with taking real chances on real people who most of America would take a dump on and be like, are you crazy? What are you thinking? I'm gonna leave it alone because I don't wanna sound uh, defensive because I'm really not. I'm very comfortable in, in, in what I do and how I operate. Now, to your bigger questions about what, but I never offer any solutions. And this is what really upset me. And it's just like, is what I'm doing just going completely over her head and others. I am crystal clear about what the solution is. His name is Jesus Christ. We talk constantly on this show about a biblical worldview. That's the solution. You may not like it. You may think that a biblical worldview is worthless in comparison. Hey, have you donated less than a half a percent of your billion dollar fortune to a school in Akron? I'm not trying to denigrate LeBron, but again, you brought it up. I, if, if I were LeBron James, that million dollars or $2 billion he gave to that school, I would have taken that money and planted a church. That's what I believe in. When you look at the decisions I've made to walk away from corporate media and to do my own thing so that I could say exactly what I believe and talk about exactly what I believe in and offer the solution that I believe in a biblical worldview. That's the solution. That's the message of this show virtually every day in nearly every segment. If you don't hear it from me, you hear it from Delano, you hear it from Shamika, you hear it from TJ Mo, you hear it from Dave Shannon, you hear it from Pastor Anthony, Pastor Bobby, you hear it from Royce White. That's, that's, that's the solution. It's, everybody thinks it's some complicated thing and like, oh my God, the solution is uh, building a school in Akron and providing free lunches. Again, I don't want to, I enjoyed, when I was in Kansas City, I was the spokesman for Big Brothers Big Sisters. And I donated a lot of my time and energy and money to supporting Big Brothers Big Sisters. I don't regret that at all. But Big Brothers Big Sisters is not the solution. Jesus Christ and a biblical worldview are the solutions. And I say that as someone who has led a sinful life. I am a sinner. I'm transparent on this show. I've said to you, I've tried things my way. They don't work. I've had all the success that any man from my circumstance could ever expect to enjoy in America. I was born with a little bit of athletic talent. I turned that into a football scholarship and a way for me and my family to escape poverty. I, did, I was able to do that because 25th Street Baptist Church in Indianapolis and Lovey Kennedy, my grandmother, Mama Lovey, planted some seeds and a worldview and a philosophy in me when I was a child that I have followed. And again, I fought against it. I've done many 
stupid, immoral, counterproductive things. I talk about them constantly on this show. They slowed my rise. I wish that I had given in and just submitted earlier. That's the message of this show that I'm like, wow, I was given a prescription for all of my problems. And trust me, I know poverty. I've talked about it on this show. Me and my father, 400 square foot apartment in the hood in 1984. Me, my mom and my brother in the hood, Grand Avenue or Grand Boulevard in Indianapolis. My mother, uh, uh, a factory worker. My father didn't graduate high school. But my grandmother gave me the greatest gift, and she gave it to a lot of people, a love of Jesus Christ and an, a rudimentary, uh, 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 just a baby's understanding of the power of that gospel and the philosophies taught in there. And I use those things and moved up in America. That's the solution. And that's despite doing all kinds of counterproductive things. I've talked about on this show, my gluttony and being obese and trying to fight it my way. It did not work. The only thing that has been successful over the last 30 years was me giving it to God and going to the Bible and submitting to his will and his philosophy on how I should eat. That's why I've had success over the last year. I talk about these things constantly. The message of this show, the solution we offer on a daily basis, God, Jesus, Christianity, the gospel, I'm sorry you don't like it. I'm sorry you've been convinced that all these other uh, solutions are better than the biblical solution. I didn't have big brothers, big sisters. I didn't have any charity as a child. None. I had my mother and father, my brother and my sister, and my stepbrother and stepsister, and a biblical worldview. That's all I needed. That's all you need is your family, the one God gave you, mama and daddy, your grandparents, your brothers and sisters, and a biblical worldview can fix your problems. That's the solution I'm offering for African Americans. I'm sorry everyone else has sold out and has convinced you that cutting a check will fix all the problems. And trust me, I've cut checks and will cut more trying to help people along the way. But if they will not accept this godly advice and understand that's really what I'm offering you, they get no money from me. They get no opportunity from me. I leave them alone because none of it, the money, the school in Akron, big brothers, big sisters, without God, none of it's getting fixed, period, end of story. And so I walked away from a lot of money and the opportunity to be what all these other guys on TV are. So I could continue to tell people there's something more important than money. And it's a biblical worldview. And so I don't understand how this is going over anybody's head. I'm, the, the whole point of this show is about the solution. I'm offering it every day. And if you don't like the way I wrap it up and package it, that's why I bring on Delano and TJ Moe and Shamika Michelle and Pastor Anthony and Pastor Bobby. Maybe they can package it up better. I'm not, at, I'm not begging you to take it my way. Is that Burger King have it your way? Or ha 
have it my way. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm, I'm sending the same message through other people who perhaps come at it a different way. But the solution is always the same. And so now I, I want because this is why it's going to take all day for me to get through this, because I, I want to unpack why I'm critical of black culture. And it's because black culture is being used to demonize American culture. Black culture has been packaged up by satanic people to be the gateway drug to Satanism. And so again, you got to I, I, I don't care if you don't like it. These are the facts, the culture that the puppet masters have designed for black people is satanic and it's intentional. And it's because they know that in order to move a culture here in America, you got to move black people first. And that's why you've seen this cultural shift. That's why, that's why you've seen the culture detach black people from their religious beliefs. Again, if you don't like this show, it's because you don't like what I'm basically saying. I'm saying that Hollywood, the puppet masters, the globalists, they're all Jim Jones feeding black people Marxism. Jim Jones was the cult leader from the 1970s that hoodwinked a group of mostly black people to go over to Guyana and kill themselves. He was a Marxist. He cast himself originally as a minister. That was to bait people in. And then he detached them from their religion and gave them Marxism and then fed them Kool-Aid and they all killed themselves in some jungle in Guyana. That's what's going on here in America. Black people, because of our tradition and our importance to control of American culture, we're the lab rats. We've been fed the satanic culture and they're using that to spread that satanic culture all across America and all across the globe. And I'm objecting to it. And I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable. I'm sorry if your minister or whatever your understanding of God is, that your minister does not tell you these things because he wants to be a part of that culture more than he wants to tell you the truth. This show is trying to inspire men, particularly ministers, into telling their congregation the truth and trying to create the room and an atmosphere where they can tell their congregation the truth, where they can say, Hey man, this culture that y'all, everybody's talking about, we got to do it for the culture, the culture, the culture, the culture. It's satanic. All of it. I, I, I'm going <clears> to <throat> walk you through a little bit of just why I'm saying this, a little bit of American history in terms of, l l we'll start with our founding fathers. And I'll call Ben Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams. Call them the Mount Rushmore of our founding fathers. And, and one thing that people don't understand, and I can't remember, I, I talk so much, I can't remember what I've talked about on this show, what I've talked about with other people, but I was watching a documentary um, this past weekend about Ben Franklin. And someone helped me out. Did I mention this yesterday on the show? I can't remember, but I, I know I had a conversation with somebody. I was watching a Ben Franklin documentary. And it, this wasn't the point of the documentary, but it was just a subtle point that came up. Like that era, back before technology, 
back before there were cars, before there were video games and phones and all that, and, and, and books everywhere, back before there was a printing press or the, the proliferation of a, a printing press. The Bible was the number one book in America, and it was the number one way to entertain yourself in America. And if you wanted to impress people, being able to recite biblical scripture was a way to impress people and win the hearts of women. And it's because, again, there were no cell phones, there was no Instagram, there was no social media. The Bible and being able to recite it. So everybody in that time, when I say everybody, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but the overwhelming majority of people in that time knew the Bible forward and backwards in comparison to where we are today. And so that culture that they created, and yes, they had slavery. I get it. That was a global phenomenon. But everybody back in that time knew the Bible well. It was a much more religious society. They had no other options. And so from that culture where everybody's immersed in scripture, they came up with these founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. They came up with these founding documents that were biblically inspired. And the reason why is because the entire culture knew the Bible, respected the Bible. They, they were sinners just like everybody else. They didn't follow everything in the Bible, but they knew it and respected it. The great influence, I'm caught Ben Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, the Mount Rushmore, the founding fathers. I'm calling them the first influencers of American culture. And then we move on to a second group later in American history of influences. I'm calling it Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Franklin Roosevelt, and Martin Luther King. That's about a hundred year span from Lincoln, I believe, president in 1860, Dr. King uh, assassinated in, in 1968. That's about a hundred year span where Lincoln, Douglas, Franklin Roosevelt, and Martin Luther King. Obviously, Martin Luther King was a man of the Bible. Uh, Frederick Douglass, a religious person. Roosevelt and Lincoln, political, but with a respect for uh, American, uh, for Christianity. And so by the time Dr. King gets assassinated and this hundred year era is over in, in 1968 when Dr. King gets assassinated, the left has figured out like, whoo, this society is too attached to Christian values. And if we're going to detach them, we need to uh, detach a specific demographic of America from its religious beliefs. Because again, as I've argued repeatedly on this show, the African-American journey in America is the most compelling narrative in the history of America. It moves American culture. Frederick Douglass, Richard Allen, the abolitionists of, of the 17 and 1800s, they held America accountable and put America on steroids and made America live up to its best ideals. So there's the tradition of African Americans influencing, significantly influencing American culture because that journey is so fascinating, captivating, compelling, so central to the America's rise. The left figures this out. The Marxists figured this out. They figured it out long ago. They couldn't execute it until the 1960s. And that's when we started pivoting. And so I want to go, here's our next group of what I call the most important influencers of American culture. We've moved away from politics and ministers, and the next thing you know, 
America's greatest influencers are idols. Michael Jordan, Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jackson, Muhammad Ali. Idols. American idols. That's what's influencing the culture. This here, not totally toxic like the group that follows them. You know, those Oprah, Michael, Michael Jackson comes from a, a family. Say whatever you want about Joe Jackson. Michael Jordan certainly comes from a family. Muhammad Ali comes from a family. Oprah Winfrey comes from a family tight with her dad. Her, her dad just passed away. But this next group that replaced that group, LeBron James, Jay-Z, Colin Kaepernick, and Kim Kardashian. That's the toxic, demonic Mount Rushmore of influencers ruling America and moving us towards Satanism. I don't care whether you people like it, love it, hate it, hate me for saying it, but it's a fact. The puppet masters, the people in control of Hollywood and the music industry, the people in control of politics, they're using black culture to take this country down a path of destruction. This culture that's been handed to us is not our culture. I'm trying, this show is about trying to walk you through. Hey man, they came up with a culture and handed it to you and they got LeBron James and Jay-Z and Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre selling this garbage to you. You're adopting it as your culture. You're living your whole life about this culture and it's, oh my God, I smoke weed and I use drugs. Oh, I get money however I can. If I gotta sell my body to do it, I'm perfectly fine with it. If I gotta make music uh, uh, for little kids about all this sexual depravity, as long as I'm getting money, I'm good with it. If I gotta do smash and grabs, if I gotta call every white person a bigot, even though I know it's not the truth, I'll do it. As long as I'm getting money and as long as I'm moving up. That's not our culture. Our culture had been America's greatest Christians, most passionate Christians. We use that to move ahead in this country and to free ourselves and to create opportunities for people like me. And now we've got Mo, Larry Curley and Kim Kardashian, the influencers of debauchery and stupidity. Half these people, LeBron James and Jay-Z and Colin, I'm gonna move Jay-Z out of this one. LeBron James and Colin Kaepernick, two of the dumbest athletes of all time. You put them in a debate, again, idiots. Attached to no religious principles, no religious morals or values. All these rappers, Jay-Z, Dr. Dre, Snoop, all of them, Ice Cube, all of them, satanic music, all of them promoting a satanic culture. And it's get the left knows. Let's walk black people up away from their religious beliefs, detach them from God, and America will follow suit. That's why I'm critical every day of black culture, because I see signs of this every day. And I know you'd like for me to come on here, some of you, well, bash white people more, bash white people more. I am bashing white people while I'm talking because they're the puppet masters. They're the ones that define this culture for us and have incentivized and paid these idiots. That's again, yesterday when I talked about bamboozled, they have incentivized all of this debauchery. They have basically told black kids, play basketball, 
or rap about uh, promiscuous sex, drug dealing and killing each other. And we will make you millionaires. Oprah didn't do that. Look, <laughs> that's white folks. And, and I'm just sorry, and I get mad at me if you won't, but uh, there's a strong Jewish influence in the music industry and in Hollywood. They did it. And I'm not talking about all of them, but you gotta own it. They define that lane for us, and I'm telling black people, cut it out, stop it. What are we doing? Betraying all of our values for this debauchery that they put a little price tag a dollar on, and, 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 and we're just taking those dollars and selling our children out, this country out, and ourselves out. This whole thing, and again, the, the point of this show, and I, again, I got a lot to unpack. I hope I get to uh, Anthony or whatever, because this is, but everything that I'm talking about, much of it, has been inspired by and or uh, backed up for me by uh, the Reverend Tony Evans. I've talked about him on this show. We played clips from him before. But uh, this week, I was watching uh, a series that uh, Tony did on American Idols. And, and I, and I want to play two or three of these clips back to back. This is the first one. He talks about culture as an idol. And, and, and again, th that's what this show gets at all the time, idolatry and uh, the hostility towards truth and the celebration of the matriarchy. And Tony talks all the time about idolatry being the root of all sin and how we've made culture an idol. And so let's, there's a first clip where he talks about the, the change in American culture uh, where he says we used to have home field advantage when, when he talks about the previous American culture and how much respect it had for Judeo-Christian values. Now, talks about the media, talks about idols, talks about the people that have been chosen to install, promote, normalize this satanic, idolatrous culture. The, the entire point of this show and what I've been trying to do and what we have been doing with this show is try to back up people like Tony Evans, ministers that are out working in the front lines, working in the church. And again, what, what he talks about in, in this, and you should really watch the entire thing. And it, it's about this cultural shift that the culture used to support Christian values that you use the cultures, the educational system. You could pray in school. You could go into a, a, a court system and the Ten Commandments would be on a wall somewhere. The culture used to support ministers. This show is trying to support ministers in a biblical worldview. We're trying to talk about the culture in a way that no one else in the media, likes to do, wants to do. You certainly can't see it in corporate media. They never mention God. They never mention a biblical worldview. If they do, they bring on some half-baked minister like Al Sharpton who will pervert it and bend it to the culture. This show isn't about bending it to the culture. It's about holding a mirror up to the culture so that you can make proper decisions. This culture is sick and perverted and satanic. And this show is going to continue to hold a mirror up to it every chance we get. 
because it's killing us. I want to get to the last part that Tony in this sermon, and again, I, it's, it, I think it's called The Idol of Culture, if you want to look it up on YouTube. It's only a 30-minute sermon, but it's brilliant. There's other ones in this series, but this one in particular will lay the foundation and help you understand what's going on here in America. But he, here was his final summation. He used the story of Daniel and, and leaving Israel and, and, and basically taking a job with Nebuchadnezzar and, and just living in the real world, but drawing a line in the sand as a follower of God and how we've gotten away from that. Let's play that clip. I don't know if that needs any elaboration or explanation, but the, this is what we do on this show. And, and so the, the argument that I'm making on this show virtually every day and, and what Loretta's complaining about and others have complained about is black people running around on social media saying, we want favor, we want to be loved, we want to be treated this way, blah, blah, blah. But we have a culture that's been handed to us that we've embraced and we celebrate as ours that is sick and evil. It's criminal. It's perverse. It abandons its kids and embraces baby mama culture. It's running around like abortion is one of the highest things we can support. We call each other the N word every chance we get. We, you can't go into a nightclub where we're at without going through a metal detector because we're so prone to shooting and killing each other. We're selling dope and drugs and we put drug dealers and dope dealers on pedestals as if they're uh, the kings of our community. We buy up music that denigrates us. We won't draw a line in the sand, but we want favor. And again, I'm not distancing myself from any of this criticism. If you listen to this show, I'm telling you, I've been right there with you. Made rap music, friends with rappers, know every Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre song. But damn it, we gotta draw a line in the sand. Our kids are being obliterated and slaughtered, drawn into a lifestyle that won't allow them to reproduce, a lifestyle that the Bible is crystal clear on. But now we're the face of the LGBTQ. And y'all mad at me? Because I'm standing out in the streets on this show every day saying, hey, this is crazy. We won't favor, but we won't draw the line at anything. Nothing. We, we sitting around letting uh, white women, white liberals run around. Oh, my God, you, you better allow abortion. What are black women going to do without abortion? We won't draw the line. We wanting around caping up and defending criminals. Predators in our community. Oh, my God. How could they shoot Jacob Blake? Yeah, he had a knife. Yeah, he was there harassing a young black woman that he had already sexually assaulted. But how could they? Oh, Rayshard Brooks. Yeah, he took a taser off a police officer and shot at him. But how could they? Yeah, George Floyd souped up on every drug in the book and uncooperative with police for 30 minutes, but how could they? And I know y'all don't like it, but it's a fact. The man overdosed. If he wasn't on them drugs, nothing would have happened. It's a fact. Man got a nine minute contribution to America in his life, the last nine minutes of his life, and we, we're building statues for him. And again, that's why you need to go watch this entire Tony 
Evans deal. And, and again, when they talk about idolatry and God being jealous and you building statues and putting people on pedestal that have nothing to do with God and y'all going to visit. Oh, this is where George Floyd got killed. Let me take a picture. Like y'all visiting a crucifixion scene. This man was a, a porn drug, uh, robbed a, a woman at gunpoint. And we got him on a pedestal like he's a God. And, and, and nobody wants to draw a line in the sand and say anything about it. And you wonder why we have no favor? You wonder why this country's headed to hell in a handbasket? We won't draw the line. And so I, many of y'all don't like my solution, but it is the solution, a biblical worldview, a return to God. Again, and I fought it. And it, just like I said, I was a sinner in every strip club trying to bang every young girl I could. But I had to draw a line in the sand and not defile myself. Because there's just no way I'm going to answer to God and have him say, look at this world you left your nieces and nephews and these young people. No way. We got to draw a line in the sand. And if we're not man enough to draw a line in the sand and we just want to be a part of culture, and we want to be popular, we get exactly what we deserve. Hell right here on earth. I want to take a breath here because I'm not remotely done. I want to take a breath here and take care of some business. America needs change, but the center of that change has to be the family, your family. We can return to that time with our families and create moments for real conversation, but it's only then we can create the change that we want to see. It all starts at the dinner table with time together as a family. Good Rancher's mission is to bring people to the table. Making those moments around the table easy, accessible, and delicious is what they do best, and it's what they deliver in every single box. Good Ranchers guarantees you 100% American meat that's born, raised, and harvested here in the United States and delivered to your door. You will know exactly where it comes from and who you're supporting. I've personally tried it and it is awesome. It's not like one delivery is great and the next isn't. No, every box has superior quality, flavor, and value. The T-bones, burgers, ribeyes, and even the chicken. It's all some of the best. Good Ranchers is a company that supports American agriculture. Plus, they support us and what we do, so go check them out, support those who support us. Make sure to use my promo code, FEARLESS, to get $30 off your order, plus get free express shipping. You can make gatherings at the table common again with Good Ranchers. Take advantage of this offer before it's gone. Go to GoodRanchers.com fearless to start bringing people to the table, creating change in America, and eating seriously delicious food from Good Ranchers. Don't go anywhere. We're going to keep it rolling. I don't, I don't even want to, I, I, I got no time to waste here. I'm trying to squeeze as much of this in. You know, we may have to roll this into tomorrow because I can't even believe how little work I've done so far. But I, I, I want to give you some real life examples of what I'm talking about and where we've gotten off course and, and try to bring home examples of what Tony Evans is talking about, what I'm talking about, these idols and, and, and that have been installed to lead us astray. And when I say us, I'm talking about all of America. Again, you control American culture by controlling black culture. That has been the history of America. When, trust, when you bring down black people, you're bringing down America. And so this satanic culture that they've handed black people, hip hop and all this garbage, that's a plan and a plot to bring down America. Again, it's just like what Tony ever said. They're, they're after your kids and they're after us. Your kids, black, white, green, yellow, brown, whatever, they're listening, they're ingesting this same garbage. Now they got black folks out here selling the garbage, selling the drugs, selling the dope culture, selling the, get the prison culture, selling the LGBTQ lifestyle. 
but they're selling it to your kids, all of our kids, in a, an attempt to bring this country down. And if we're not man enough or woman enough to draw a line in the sand and say enough is enough and stand on these biblical principles that this country was founded upon, it's over. We're toast. Your kids are going to live hell on earth. I did not live hell on earth as a kid. Had an awesome childhood because the people that planted the seeds and built the culture that I lived in were actually attached to a biblical worldview. And that's whether they were super religious or not. I got the benefit from what the culture they established. The culture that's being established right now, you're wondering why they got drag queens at your libraries and in, in schools trying to groom your kids. It's because of the culture we've built and the culture we've allowed and how we've become idolatrous to culture. But I'm, I'm gonna give you a sports example of, of just, just the little subtle games and things that get played. And I hope I, I got time to get through this. But Charles Barkley, a uh, friend of mine, the, the broadcaster, former NBA Hall of Famer, he went on the podcast with Ryan Clark, Channing Crowder, and I believe Fred Taylor. It's called The Pivot. Uh, it's, uh, did look like an hour long interview. Bunch of athletes, former NBA player, former NFL players, all sitting around talking. And, and again, you guys have heard me. I'm friends with Charles. I like Charles. Uh, but this group of guys aren't rocket scientists. This isn't a group of journalists. This is a group of millionaire pampered athletes whose uh, talents uh, became very obvious at a very early age, 12, 13 years old and lived very pampered lives all the way through adulthood because many of them made generational wealth and enough money, that, again, they're detached from reality. These aren't the guys, and again, I love Charles because he's self-aware enough to know, these aren't the guys you were cheating off of in high school. These are the guys that, you know, barely paid attention in high school and, you know, got through state eligible in college. Again, I used to be one of them. I'm not talking about something I know nothing about. You can go check my transcripts in high school and college. I was nobody's rocket scientist. Luckily, I didn't make it to professional sports and get handed millions of dollars despite all the bad intellectual habits I had embraced. I actually had only had enough to play a little bit at a mid-major and then I had to intellectually evolve if I was gonna make it in this world. But this ain't about me. L let me, Barkley and these guys are having a conversation and, and they, they go down the, uh, Ryan Clark takes them down the path of the Black Lives Matter idolatry and, and brings up uh, Breonna Taylor, I believe, here. Let, let's play this exchange between Ryan Clark and Charles Barkley. <laughs> So that was Charles Barkley, <clears throat> 59 years old, with some wisdom and common sense, sharing it with these young, spoiled, pampered athletes. And I don't want to put up, but Ryan Clark thinks he's some sort of rocket scientist and genius. And, and again, athletes uh, get invited to speak to young kids because they're great athletes. And the professional athletes, they're great athletes and they've made a lot of money, put them in front of kids. It's like putting Snickers bars in front of kids. It's like Halloween, it's candy. None of it, it tastes good, but none of it is edifying. None of it does you any good. And so I, I, I get why Ryan Clark thinks he's smart and thinks he's got this responsibility as a, as a journalist to talk about, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's not, none of his thinking is sound and Maybe by the time he gets to Barkley's age, it will be, but who knows, by then it'll be too late, or he'll be so committed to his idiocy that he'll never evolve. But I've talked about it repeatedly on this show, just for men to be sitting around talking about Breonna Taylor, and for none of them 
to have the balls to say, hey, look, what was her boyfriend doing letting her walk to the front door with him when they allegedly thought intruders were trying to break in? That's violation of man code 101. Ain't none of y'all men if, if you're allowing your woman walk head first into trouble. And again, this all comes from a, a biblical worldview. And again, that's why I keep saying it's the solution. Because if a man accepts the responsibility handed to him by God, Breonna Taylor would not be in that front room and she would not have gotten shot. But again, you can't talk about a biblical worldview in corporate media. And what corporations are paying for are for athletes who have been detached from uh, God, who think they're God because they make so much money, How? what other explanation could there be other than they're God? Or they're so addicted to social media and how what they say gets perceived on social media, they can't go anywhere close to the truth. So. That's that comment. Now I want to play uh, an exchange between uh, Ryan Clark and Barkley about black on black crime. Again, Ryan Clark lying. Uh, and again, there's a hostility towards truth. And, and they put limited intellectual people like Ryan as the face of these shows because limited intellectual people and people with little integrity, they don't stick to a truth. And so he inferred that there have been marches and protests when black cops kill uh, black people. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, well, when, when did that happen? Everybody knows the game. Everybody knows the truth. It's like everybody knows today is Wednesday. And everybody knows that the only time we march and protest is when a white cop kills a black person. Those are just facts. It's like saying, hey, Jason Whitlock's fat. That's a fact that I have to deal with. I can't, oh, well, you know what? I've lost 50 pounds. Now, I'm still fat. I got to deal with that fact. And th this again, real men aren't afraid of facts because we're fearless. And so this is a very feminized conversation. Anytime you hear people start lying and avoiding facts, that's a very feminine conversation. And, and Barkley there sitting there, again, got the wisdom of being nearly 60 years old. Like, hold up, man. Talk about black on black crime because it happens so often. And Ryan Clark knows this. It's a deflection tactic. Well, there's white on white crime. You know what? There is white on white crime. But let me tell you the difference, and Ryan Clark knows it because he, he doesn't live the same life as me. You go into a black nightclub, you gotta go through a metal detector because black people are so afraid of each other and the violence that we're willing to do to each other that it's damn near like going through TSA at an airport to get into a nightclub for us to drink with each other. White people don't do that. You ain't going through no metal detector in TSA and a strip search to go into a white nightclub. So we're playing games. Man up and have a manly conversation, but we don't do that because we've, create, we've put idiots as idols and emasculated men as idols and we can't even have a manly discussion. And again, so when you're asking about what's the solutions being offered on this show, this shows the solution is, let's be men. Let's be the men God intended us to be. We're not afraid of the facts. We know and believe, John 8, 32, that the truth will set us free. And so we don't run from the truth. Let me give you one more <clears throat> from this, and, and this will take me a second to unpack, but I think this is Channing Crowder, Ryan Clark, and, and Bar they're basically saying there's no George, no white George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery.
Actually, he's not 100% correct. He's an athlete pretending to be some intellectual thought leader. Uh, he's not. He's a former football player. No disrespect. But again, know who you are. And at one point, I wish I had cut out the clip, but earlier in, the sh in this interview, they talked about, hey, just being smart at what you're good at. And, and again, talking on TV about these real life issues and a culture like, this is not what they're good at. They, again, just like I talked about yesterday with Bamboozled, they're installed, supported, and backed by a system that wants a dumbed down conversation about black people and black culture because they're using black culture to promote an idolatry, a racial idolatry, and they're using black culture to impose a satanic culture on all of America. And so, these guys, they don't know, these are just useful idiots. From a Ryan Clark, Channing Crowder, and I'm sorry for, it sounds like I'm calling them names, but, because maybe if I was their age and as talented as they were athletically, I'd be right there with them. Luckily, I was too short and too fat to be any type of professional athlete, and so, uh, luckily, I had to evolve other ways. They didn't have to, but they're being given shows and platforms to pretend like they know what they're talking about. So I just want to walk you through, first of all, that Ahmaud Arbery. And who's the white Ahmaud? Ahmaud Arbery was killed by two white idiots. A third one was also charged, but I blame the two redneck idiots that shot and killed him. They weren't law enforcement. They were wannabe cops. Uh, so two white idiots get in a little neighborhood dispute with Ahmad Arabery and kill him and they go to prison for it. Uh, Ethan Lyman, the kid, the white kid killed uh, outside LeBron James's high school, killed by, I believe, three or four uh, black idiots. Uh, not, not, you know, not by gun, but they beat this kid into the ground and killed him. I'd compare him to Ahmad Arbery, but, but more than that, Let's take George Floyd. And, and this information has been out there, it's been written about, it's been talked about, but again, these are athletes, they're not, they're in place because they are uninformed. Tony Temple, to, Tony Temple, this has been written about, talked about, I believe it's in 2016. This white boy called the police because he was in some emotional distress he took some medication for mental health, and the police kneeled on him and uh, till he went unconscious, and he died. And it's on videotape. And it's on videotape of the police laughing and joking as Tony Tempa died. We're gonna just play 45 seconds, a minute of this tape, but the information, Tempa is spelled T-I-M-P-A. If you want to go look it up, uh, Tony, go look it up, but we'll play a little of the clip. I made breakfast, scrambled eggs, your favorite. <laughs> what, waffles? Waffles. Fruity, tooty, fruity waffles. I think he's out cold now. Yeah, he's, he's my wake up. Yeah. Oh no, he just got quiet. All of a sudden, just bloop. The dark here? Oh, there he comes. Dude died. Cops completely exonerated. Go look it up. That's just a small snippet of it. It's bad. It's as bad as George Floyd. And they're laughing and joking about it. The cops walked. It's on tape. Just like George Floyd, Tony Tempered put some drugs into his system and his medication that he had been using cocaine. Walked. Derek Chauvin's in prison, probably for the rest of his life. Those cops walked. This information's been out there for years. The video's been out there for years, but the media doesn't pay attention to it. Then I, I, I want, <laughs> there is no worse video than the assassination of Daniel Shaver. I, 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 wanna, I wanna play, white dude, I believe in, Arizona or somewhere, he's with some girl that he had met in a hotel, and 
uh, someone can see through his window that it appears he has a gun. He was a pest control worker and it was a pellet gun that he used in pest control that he had showed this woman, yeah, this is the pest control gun I use, blah, blah. Someone mistook it for a gun, called the police. Police show up at his hotel. This man is on his knees begging for his life when he is assassinated by a white police officer. And he's white. Daniel Shaver. I believe the guy that killed him, Michael Braceford. I, I, I think we got a decent sized chunk of this because you got to hear the way the officer talks to him. This is an assassination. This is 10 times worse than what happened to George Floyd. Play the tape. Another mistake. There is a very severe possibility you're go both going to get shot. Do you understand that? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. What the this is shut up. I'm not here to be tactful or diplomatic with you. You listen, you obey. For one thing, did I tell you to move, young man? Did I tell you to put both your hands, put both your hands on the top of your head and interlace your fingers? Take your feet and cross your left foot over your right foot. Who else is in the room? Nobody. All right, stand by, we have contact. All right. Are you both drunk? No. No. All right. So you're not going to have any problems understanding anything that I tell you, right? Correct. Yes. All right. Can I go to my room? No, you're not going to do anything but come towards us. Young man, you are not to move. You are to put your eyes down and look down at the carpet. You are to keep your fingers interlaced behind your head. You are to keep your feet crossed. If you move, we are going to consider that a threat. And we are going to deal with it, and you may not survive it. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Young lady, shut up and listen. All right? You are to keep your feet crossed. Take both of your hands, put them flat in front of you. You are to push yourself up to a kneeling position. Kneeling position. Now, put both your hands in the air. Okay, crawl towards us. I'm so sorry. No, Rich, pull, pull him this Rich, way. Pull. Come on, come on. Let me know when you're clear. Clear? No, you're not clear. You have a crystal. You're not. You're being the chainsaw. You're going to grab it. Just keep pulling. We'll be done. Okay, when you're done with that, lay her flat. Okay, I need one more cup for up. Okay. This is the deal. We're going to do almost like we did before. Okay. okay, young man, listen to my instructions and do not make a mistake. You are to keep your legs crossed. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. You are to put both of your hands, palms down, straight out in front of you. Push yourself up to a kneeling position. I said, keep your legs crossed! I didn't say this in conversation. Hands Put your hands in the air! Hands up in the air! You do that again, we're shooting you. Do you understand? Oh, please do not shoot me. I'm then listen to my instructions. I'm trying to just do what you Don't do. talk! Listen! Hands straight up in the air. Do not put your hands down for any reason. You think you're going to fall, you better fall on your face. Your hands go back in the small of your back or down. We are going to shoot you. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Crawl towards me. Crawl towards me! We cut away because the next thing you would have saw or heard was the cops shooting and killing this young man. It, 
Go look it up, Daniel Shaver. Go watch it for yourself. It's been out there for three or four years. The cop walked, found not guilty, assassinated that young man. Did everything possible to provoke that young man into making a mistake. And the kid didn't even make a mistake. He's trying to crawl with his hands up and his feet got tangled up and he falls forward and the cop assassinated him and he walked. Ten times worse than George Floyd. And we got athletes sitting on platforms, uh, it's, show me the white George Floyd. Show me the white Ahmaud Arbery. These guys are clueless. This stuff has been out there for years. They're committed to a lie. Because this entire culture is committed to a lie. And black people, black lives matter, black culture is all being used to tear this country down. They're tearing black people down first and then they're tearing this country down. No one can speak out against it. No one can draw a line in the sand because they're playing a game. Oh my God, if you're critical of black culture, you're a sellout, you're racist, you're a terrible human being. This culture's sick. It's perverted. It's profane, it's obscene. It denigrates everybody, including black people, first and foremost. It doesn't believe in forgiveness. It doesn't believe in grace and mercy. It's the antithesis of Christianity. And you're wondering why I'm talking about it? and pointed it out, I'm trying to wake you up. You've been indoctrinated into a satanic cult. If someone thought, oh like, oh my God, you're about to follow George, I mean Jim Jones over to Guyana and he's going to kill you and I'm doing everything in my power to say, hey look, you're following a cult leader. This thing that they have defined as black culture is a cult, a satanic cult that is leading to our destruction and walking us away from God. What's the solution? The solution is a return to biblical values. I'm going to uh, take care of a little bit more business. Feeling a little less like your old self, getting older definitely changes your body. As men age, our body naturally loses free testosterone. It happens to every man and can make it more difficult to stay in shape and be energetic, active. Maybe you don't have time to work out, but want the energy and body you once had. Wouldn't it be nice to have the energy to counter the negative physical effects of aging? Nugenics Total T Testosterone Booster contains testophen, which has been validated in five clinical studies shown to boost free testosterone levels in men. Because Nugenics Total T boosts free testosterone that the aging process robs, you'll feel stronger, leaner, with more energy and drive and more passion too. Your partner will notice the difference. Nugenics Total T is the number one selling testosterone booster at GNC, and it can help re-energize your life to help you get back to the powerful, confident, and good-looking warrior you used to be. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenix Total Tea when you text FEARLESS to 231231. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenix Thermo, their most powerful fat incinerator ever with key ingredients to help you get back into shape fast. Absolutely free. Text FEARLESS to 231231. Text FEARLESS to 231231. Uh, Yep, we're, we're not going anywhere. I'm just going to keep it rolling. Hopefully you guys aren't tired of me, but I want to get into this uh, candidate, political candidate down in uh, Louisiana, I believe, Gary Chambers uh, Jr. Uh, calls himself an ordained minister. 
uh, I believe he's running for Congress. He put out an advertisement uh, earlier this week or late last week, uh, pro-abortion, calls himself an ordained minister. Let's watch his campaign ad. On June 24th, the Supreme Court voted to overturn Roe v. Wade and created a real-life horror story for women in America. This decision has stripped the rights to a legal and safe abortion from millions of women in this country. It does not, however, stop abortions from happening. Countries that restrict abortions have a higher rate of abortion than countries that don't. An estimated 1.2 million women received unsafe abortions each year before Roe v. Wade. Women in poverty are less likely to be able to afford safe methods of abortion and also risk being blackmailed to receive services and maintain confidentiality. Cases of severe hemorrhaging, poisoning, infection, or damage to internal organs are all life-threatening results that hospitals will now be faced with. I am an ordained minister, and regardless of what we all believe in, we choose those beliefs for ourselves. For scripture says in Corinthians, for why is my liberty being judged by another man's conscience? The government, comprised of mostly white men, has no place to decide for women what is right for them. The ability for any woman in America to make choices concerning her own health is a natural basic democratic right of every woman. Abortions won't end, but this democracy will if the government refuses to stay out of people's personal choices. Make no mistake about it, women will die, and there's nothing pro-life about that. I'm Gary Chambers, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate to be one of the votes needed to codify a woman's right to choose as the law of the land. <clears throat> so here's a guy claiming to be an ordained minister. And he thinks it's his job to codify a woman's right to choose. And basically what he's saying, the right to choose abortion. And this is why I, I keep saying, and, and he plays the race card, mostly white men did X, Y, and Z, and established these laws. Again, th that's the race card, and this is how I'm saying how race is being used to codify, normalize, and impose standards that are in direct contradiction to the Bible, to the gospel, to Jesus Christ, to the word of God. They're using race. Gary Chambers, again, politics is his idol, race is his idol, God is not his true idol. He, he get, <laughs> a minister is like, regardless of what the Bible says, we all get to choose. But again, when you're an ordained minister, none of your sentences should start out with regardless of what the Bible says. But again, this is why I keep talking about they're disconnecting us from God. He's not serving God when he said, regardless of what the Bible says, uh, women need the right to choose this abortion. This is, again, he thinks he's serving women. And this is my issue with black culture. It's too matriarchal. Men have been emasculated. They think their job is to serve women. I reject that. Our job is to serve God. That's a fact. It was a well understood fact for a long time in this country. And serving God did black people well and made America. And this is a fact. The safest, the most, the, the, land, of op, the land of the greatest opportunity for black people any place on the planet. That's just a fact. We're safer here and have more opportunity here than any place else on the planet. Our standard of living here as black people, higher than black people any other place on the planet. You gonna blame mostly white men for that, Gary Chambers? But Gary Chambers like a lot of people. I'm going to repeat myself. He's serving women. We have a matriarchal culture. Anything that says, no, 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 
Y'all shouldn't do that. That's anti-woman and it must be stopped. Anything that God says, no, 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 y'all shouldn't do that. Well, we can work around that. Well, we, we don't have to pay attention to that. And again, as someone claiming to be an ordained minister, he doesn't get to, this isn't like baseball and he's a pitcher and he gets to shake the catcher off. God is just a catcher, he can shake off. No, I don't wanna throw that pitch. I know you're telling me to be pro-life. You're telling me to stand against abortion, but I'm gonna shake that off because that's telling a woman no, and I serve women, and I never tell a woman no. And that's because he's a simp. This dude has no backbone. And, and again, yes, I'm overweight, but I'm gonna say it. He smothered his backbone in so much fat, it's not strong enough to support a man. He just wants to be a politician. And so he should quit. I would have no problem with this commercial and Gary Chambers saying whatever he wants if he didn't claim to be an ordained minister. It's like, again, I'm claiming to be a Christian. That means there's a lot of things I cannot do. The decisions have been taken out of my hands. And so let's say tonight, it's not gonna happen, but let's say tonight, I hit up a McDonald's uh, drive-through window. You would never hear me try to justify that and say, well, <laughs> I'm going to codify Jason Whitlock's overweight behind. I'm going to codify him the right to choose when he wants to be gluttonous and when he wants to eat, uh, uh, wants to eat processed food and fast food. Uh, I got to, I got to make sure Jason Whitlock has the right to be as gluttonous as he wants to be. How dare, again, as a Christian, I don't have that freedom. And by not having that freedom, and by acknowledging that I don't have that freedom, it's allowed me to lose weight and become healthier. And that's all God wants for you. But Gary Chambers, claiming to be a minister, his job is to send a bat signal to other Christians, pick and choose what you want out of the Bible. And what you want is favor and salvation. Choose that. Everything else, don't worry about. And it's just like Tony Evans said at the beginning of this conversation when I played you the Tony Evans, we want, this, we want the, uh, the favor without drawing a line in the sand. Without saying, hey, we won't do X, Y, and Z. But we want all the favor. And this will not stand, it won't work. You will not be given favor. You will live hell on earth as long as we continue to not draw a line in the sand, as long as we continue to be disobedient. I wanna expose uh, Gary Chambers here just a tiny bit more. Uh, <laughs> he, he did a couple of radio interviews. Let's play these radio interviews back to back where he, again, talks about being a Christian and the Lord. He knew the Lord was going to use him, uh, but, you know, he smokes weed. L let's play these clips back to back. So I'm an ordained minister uh, mm -hmm. and grew up in the church deeply and always knew that at some point God would use my voice to speak to his people. Uh, I'd use this as my pulpit, basically. Uh, my campaign slogan is do good and seek justice, which is Isaiah 1 and 17. Do good, seek justice, help the widow, the orphan, the oppressed, and the poor. Uh, I live by that. And this is really just an opportunity for me every time to live out my faith. Mm -hmm. um, that when we talk about the issues that we face as a society, um, 
Jesus was about healing the sick, right? Mm. And if he came and healed the sick, then why isn't Medicare for all good for us? Mm. If if that was a, a, a structure of our faith that we believe he could redeem, then we also have to have the knowledge to understand that medicine works, science works, and if we're paying into a system, the church get 10% of the money from some of the people. The government get 30% of the money from all the people. Mm. They should be producing solutions in health care for the people of this country. You recently went viral for uh, you announced that you were running for Louisiana Senate and you were smoking some weed. No doubt. Talk about that. Well, uh, I think that we wanted to cut through the noise. I, I do smoke cannabis. It's not uh, something that should be controversial anymore. 68 percent of people in Louisiana believe that cannabis should be legalized recreationally. Mm-hmm. Um, and in order to make sure that we destigmatize a lot of these things, People who have platform influence, whatever that is, they need to use that platform and influence to steer a conversation. Uh, It worked. It did cut through the noise. And it got us to talk about the real issues around uh, Louisiana and cannabis. You got folks in Angola Penitentiary right now who are serving what amounts to a life sentence for basically simple possession of marijuana. Mm. That's wrong. While people in California, uh, Illinois, and other places, New York is going to come online, people are going to make millions of dollars, but you got folks still sitting in jail for it. That's not right. So, and, and Tony Evans' sermon talks about, you know, culture is the idol and culture is driving him. And that's why he wants to destigmatize drug use. And again, you've heard me talk. I used to smoke marijuana when I was in college, uh, dabble with it occasionally a few times after college. Uh, I, I can't justify it and say it's a good thing. When you look, at all the negative outcomes that come from drug and alcohol abuse. When you look, and he's talking about Angola prisons, people sitting in jail for marijuana and blah, blah, blah. People sitting in jail for violent crimes that they committed while they were using drugs and alcohol. All, all the little tough gangbangers that talk about they'll smoke this person, they'll kill this person, they're, they're doing it while on drugs. Again, it's just like, y'all want to be anti-gun, but y'all don't want to be anti the thing that allows people to pull the trigger indiscriminately, drugs and alcohol. And so he wants to destigmatize drug use. He wants to destigmatize being obese. He wants to destigmatize abortion. He wants to destigmatize anything that is satanic. Again, it's packaged cleverly. He goes on the Breakfast Club and talks with the other idols that are there to promote ignorance and debauchery and a culture that leads to death and incarceration and a lack of success. That's their job. And they're doing it gleefully under the guise, under the pretense of, hey man, we're promoting black culture. And I'm, this show is about trying to explain to you this culture they've defined for you leads to death. It leads to a lack of success. I'm going to wrap this all up by, by, by putting a button on the, the, the capital of left-wing debauchery, progressive ideology, uh, the, the headquarters for this satanic culture that we have going on now that's being driven by technology. And it's San Francisco, it's the Bay Area. You've heard me talk about it before. And again, when you start talking about the solutions that I'm offering people are an understanding of who the enemy is, how he's operating, what what tactics he's using to impose this satanic culture, and then I'm telling you the solution is a biblical worldview, biblical values, the the courage to stand on the things taught in the Bible. That's the solution. That's what this platform is about. That's what these contributors that I'm bringing on are about. We're trying to tell you what the solution is because liberalism, progressivism isn't politics aren't the solution, either left or right. I'm harder on the left because it's so crystal clear how satanic it has become. But 
I just want to make this final point uh, to Loretta, who I started out, if you guys remember, that's where I started out her, her email, her letter to me uh, uh, over Instagram. But in San Francisco, and I, I hope we have this, uh, this uh, tweet or information we can put on screen, but this is what's going on in San Francisco, which is headquarters for Black Lives Matter, headquarters for uh, the social media apps, headquarters for the Black Panther Party, headquarters for all of this far left liberalism that we see, that we as black people seem to be embracing and thinking is the solution. So I read this tweet the other day. They came out of a report about uh, the San Francisco public school system. Uh, some guy named Ryan James Gertzky, I think, tweeted this out. These numbers are just staggering. In San Francisco's public schools, 63% of black kids are chronically absent versus 8% of Asian kids. 15% of black kids are ready for high school. 15% are ready for high school versus 71% of Asian kids. 28% of black kids are reading proficient versus 70% of Asian kids. You wonder why I talk the way that I talk and why I'm objecting to this culture. Black people think their salvation is through more liberalism. There is no more liberal city than San Francisco. None. I've explained to you on this show, San Francisco and the Bay Area and Northern California's unique history that embrace the whole alternative sexual lifestyle issue in the 1800s during the 18 uh, uh, during the 1850s when the California gold rush happened and men descended upon California in search of gold and quick riches. They left their families behind. I believe 93% of San Francisco, the Bay Area, in the 1840s, late 1840s and 1850s, 93% of the population, men, and you wonder why Northern California and San Francisco are the headquarters for the LGBTQ? It's in the history. It's not an accident, it's not a coincidence. 93% of the population was there on a greedy run for gold. Men, 93% of the men, 93% of that population, men, on a hunt for gold and greed, desperate for money. And then they got desperate for sex. And that's why cross-dressing and LGBT and all that stuff is headquartered in San Francisco. The Black Panther Party, Huey, Newton, and uh, them dudes was all switch-hitting. And, and they've made them gods and idols and you all idolize them. None of them obedient to God. Black Panther Party, a Marxist party. That means hostile to God, hostile to truth. If Loretta, and I, I, I don't say this trying to be mean spirited, but if you have a problem with this show and what I'm talking about, it's possibly because you're hostile to truth. The culture has you. You're a slave to the culture. And so the explanation that I'm giving you, that the solution that I'm giving you, you reject because you think the culture can create a solution. God creates all solutions. A biblical worldview creates all solutions. This show is about waking people up to what is happening and trying to get primarily men, to embrace the responsibilities handed to us by God. This show will not make you comfortable. It will not make you feel good. 
It will put a mirror in your face, no different than the mirror I had to look at to finally snap me up out of my gluttony. No different than the mirror I had to look at and say, well, man, you made the 55 and you ain't got no kids and you're not married. And, and I could rattle off the names of a couple of women like, man, you, you let this woman and this woman get away. It was all because of my promiscuity, my sexual lust, my lack of discipline sexually caused me to make a bunch of really stupid decisions in my personal life. I had to deal with that. I had to look in the mirror and say, my disobedience to God is the reason any failure I have can be directly related to that. And then when I look at the success that I've had and I can go, you know what? It was my obedience to God is why I had success. Why were you such a great journalist? Why have you had, because I implemented all the things the Bible taught me into my work life, into my eating habits and into my personal life. I went with my instincts. Didn't work. I want you to wake up just like I'm waking up. I'm not perfect. I'm still flawed. I'm still a sinner. But I've woken up and I'm honest with myself. I deal with the truth like a man. I'm not a coward. This show isn't for cowards. And maybe this show is not for women who like cowards. If you want to be at the head of this, if you want to be the matriarch and the shot caller, this show ain't for you. These solutions I'm offering ain't for you. Go somewhere and pray that LeBron James throws a million dollars at another school in another community and does nothing. It'll be great for his branding, but it won't fix anything. When I hear LeBron James trying to direct young people towards a biblical worldview, I'll hop on board with LeBron James. Until then, he gets nothing from me, and none of them do. I'm exhausted. Can't believe I've talked this long. All right, play tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation, we all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone, I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back, we are receiving all the seeds when we all want to be free. We want freedom.